What's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? Why can't women become priests? Why do Catholics worship Mary? What's stopping you? Why do I need to confess my sins to a priest? Where is purgatory in the Bible? I think the Pope has too much authority. What's stopping you? You, you, you? you are called to communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Hi, everybody. Welcome again to Call to Communion. This is the program for our non-Catholic brothers and sisters. Now, what are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about you. If you are a non-Catholic but happen to be listening to this station today or you're catching us on the Internet or Facebook or YouTube, you're not a Catholic, but you've got questions about the Catholic faith and you would really like to get those answered. Well, this is the place to get that done. Here's our phone number, 1-800-585-9396. 1-800-585-9396. You can also text the letters EWTN to 55000. Wait for the response and then text us your first name and your brief question. Message and data rates may apply. Again, the phone number, 1-800-585-9396. And if you're watching us on TV today, you can send us an email if you wish, ctc at ewtn.com. We'll include that on a future show, ctc at EWTN.com. Michael McCall is our producer. Matt Gabinski is our phone screener. Jeff Burson is handling social media. As I mentioned earlier, he's the uh, social media guru. So if you want to uh, send us a question via Facebook or YouTube, you can certainly do that as well. I'm Tom Price along with Dr. David Anders. Tom, how are you today? You know what? I'm doing great. How about you? Yeah, I'm doing pretty well, thanks. Glad to hear that. We're going to lead off today with an email that we received from Henry. It says, I am curious to know what the Catholic Church's views are on Christian science, beliefs, and practices. Where do Catholic views and doctrines align with and part company from Mary Baker Eddy's views about God, healing, Christ, and the meaning of love? Thanks. Okay, thanks. So Christian scientism is basically uh, kind of rehashing the ancient Gnostic tradition. So it believes that uh, reality as we perceive and experience it empirically through the senses is basically illusory. uh, And among the illusions that people have are that we have physical bodies that suffer decay and sickness and death. And Mary Baker Eddy proclaimed a uh, kind of Gnostic Enlightenment view of the gospel where if you adopted her worldview, you would be uh, guaranteed uh, immunity from these things. Um, We think that that's hogwash, to put it mildly. Um, uh, Not least of the reasons is that Mary Baker Eddy herself died, a fact that the the original Christian scientists had a hard time swallowing and sought to cover up for a while. So we kind of think that reality is real, that people do have bodies, and that the the common sense view that, you know, sickness and death are are real events that we have to contend with, um, uh, that's that's actually true. So the whole worldview of Christian scientism is uh, contrary to all rational evidence, all right? And, and in fact, is is manifestly false to the witness of Scripture. So, um, I mean, the core doctrine of the Christian faith is that God became flesh, all right? That God entered into the stream of time and history and suffered, and suffered in the person of Jesus and died mm-hmm. and rose again. So uh, the whole premise of the Catholic faith contradicts uh, the basic premise of, of Christian scientism. What they have in common uh, is names, Names, not substance. Names. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, Here's one now from Richard who says, Christ said that through the Eucharist we will have everlasting life. I thought all of us have everlasting life. Does he mean that some people will not? Is that what is meant by the wages of sin is death? Oh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, not everybody has everlasting life. I mean, hell is a dogma of the Catholic faith. Not everybody goes to heaven. Okay, there it is. We'll uh, do one more here before we go to a quick break. This is uh, from Rick, and he says, uh, The Septuagint canon was translated by 70 or 72 Jewish scholars, making the Word of God available to the masses. Jesus set out 70 or 72 disciples to bring the Word of God to the masses. So are there any teachings about Jesus sending out the same number of disciples as there were Jewish, Jewish scholars as his approval for the Septuagint. Seems logical to me, but I can't find anything written down about it. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's an interesting speculative position, and I think that that would be the kind of thing that you could you could advance as a hypothesis. It's certainly not part of the, the Catholic doctrinal tradition. It's not a prominent part. If, mm-hmm. if it's ever been commented on by a church father, I'm not aware. Um, and, of course, the, the, the question of the 70 translators of the Septuagint 
is legendary, and and uh, and we, we're not particularly bound by that interpretation of its origins. I mean, that is a that's a Jewish legend. There may or may not be some truth in it. Um, whether or not Christ's uh, sending out of the seventy is any kind of analog to the translation of the Septuagint, uh, it's a purely speculative question. And I think we could probably consider that there are better explanations within the text of the Hebrew Scriptures itself, and and the and the significance of seventy as a biblical number. Rick, thank you so much for your question. When we come back, we'll be talking with J- uh, Preston in Grand Rapids, Michigan, listening to us on Holy Family Radio today. Also, we'll get to a couple of questions here from YouTube and Facebook, and we've got a phone line open for you right now, 1-800-585-9396, 1-800-585-9396. This is called to Communion on EWTN. Sharing the fullness of the Catholic faith. 1-800-585-9396. This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. What's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders. 1-800-585-9396. If you're ready now, let's get to the phones at 1-800-585-9396. We begin with Preston in Grand Rapids, Michigan, listening to us today on Holy Family Radio. Hey there, Preston, what's on your mind today? Well, gentlemen, I've been having an ongoing conversation with a uh, a Mormon friend of mine. Admittedly, I am Catholic, so I, I apologize if I'm not the target audience here, but uh, he has brought up the uh, Mormon teaching of exaltation and to support that, he's pointed to uh, the early church fathers' teaching on theosis, or how we might become like God. And uh, I, I was hoping he might be able to explain a little more distinctly between our understanding uh, of that teaching and and the uh, LDS belief in exaltation. Sure, thank uh, you so much. I appreciate it. Well, I, I don't think we can we can a- accurately or adequately contrast these points of view without understanding the difference in the Mormon conception of God and the Catholic conception of God. And one of my favorite, I won't say it's the best, but it's one of my favorite definitions of God drawn from from magisterial teaching in the Catholic tradition comes from the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215. And uh, I'm going to read the following. This is a this is part of the confession of faith that the Council Fathers articulated at the Fourth Lateran. We firmly believe and simply confess that there is only one only one true God, eternal, immeasurable, almighty, unchangeable, incomprehensible, and ineffable. All right. Uh, I'm going to skip a bit. Just one second. All right. Um, uh, Okay. One principle of all things, creator of all things invisible and visible, spiritual and corporeal, who by his almighty power at the beginning of time created from nothing both spiritual and corporeal creatures, that is to say angelic and earthly. Now, let me unpack that a little bit for you, all right? Um, uh, the Council defines God as one principle, all right, or the first principle of all things. Well, what's a principle? A principle of, you know, geometry or physics or something is a, is a, a, a statement of uh, a, sort of a unifying concept that renders the subject matter intelligible. It's in light of that thing that all the disparate elements can be made sense of, all right? And God is defined by the council as the one principle, the first principle of all of reality. So everything that is, everything that exists, is intelligible with reference to that one source and origin of all things. Um, And you'll note also that God is defined there as immeasurable, all right, eternal, outside of time, without measure, almighty, unchangeable, is impassable, Mm -hmm. um, and uh, which, uh, oh, absolutely simple in essence also. God is not made up of parts, all right, because any composite thing uh, depends on something else for the principle of its composition. So right. if God's going to be the first principle, he has to be absolute absolute simplicity, metaphysical simplicity, outside of time, not subject to change in any way. All right. Now, that concept of God is just radically different from the Mormon idea of God, just radically different, because Mormons, their understanding of God is that God is essentially a creature, all right, that the God that they worship had a historical origin in time um, and is, uh, is not... Uh, 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 and not spiritual, by the way, is yeah. uh, possesses a material body and has always had a material body as part of his constituent nature. 
um, and depends, therefore, on things like the laws of physics and chemistry or or you know some cosmological principle that precedes him for his existence. Mm-hmm. Right. So so it at least to the Catholic way of seeing things, the way Mormons understand God, he's more like a demigod from pagan mythology, like Zeus or oh, yeah. Jupiter or something like that. All right. And uh, and they're they're basically henotheists, which is to say that they think that God, that God, the God of the Bible, the God they worship, he he might be the the sort of the chief executive of our version of reality. Mm-hmm. All right. He he calls the shots in this world. Uh, but he's not the only God as such that exists in reality. And and reality itself must derive its existence from some prior principle. So these are just very, very, very different ways yeah. of conceiving of the nature of God. And therefore, likeness to God must mean something radically different. Um, you know, there's all kinds of exal- exaltation that a chief executive can extend to you right, in virtue of his power and jurisdiction. Mm-hmm. You know, the president can give you the the Presidential Medal of Honor or something. So that the God, as Mormons conceive it, could could give you a lot of things, all right, yeah. uh, and could could give you glory and so forth. And if uh, and if I'm not mistaken, could even assign you sort of executive authority over your own little world, so you can kind of become your own little God, like He's a God, all right. But this again is just incredibly different from the way that Catholics understand uh, the exaltation, the glorification that we look forward to in Christ. The end of the Catholic's life, end meaning the goal or the purpose, is that we might gaze upon the very essence of God in the beatific vision. And that is to have direct, intuitive knowledge of the ultimate source and origin of all things, not just of this temporal world, but of reality as such. And St. Paul says, now we see as through a glass darkly, then we will know fully, even as we're fully known. And the one thing that there is an analog between God's immensity and our own life, and that is the immensity of our soul, the immensity of the human soul that has nigh unto infinite capacity for uh, uh, its, in its desire for knowledge and beatitude. And we know that there's nothing temporal or finite that can satisfy that desire. All right, I mean, that's, that's manifest to us throughout historical life, sure. day after day after day, mm-hmm. all right? Um, and our expectation is that in the beatific vision that an, an, an infinite object will satisfy our infinite appetite, mm. okay? And, and since he is the source and origin of all good, gazing upon him and being made like him, all right, it will, will be a share in his glory in a created manner. Preston, is that helpful for you? Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, the, the challenge seems to be with uh, the particular, their, their particular pointing to the use of the word theosis, and um, it, it gets a little convoluted for me because well, it well, was used by... Th- this is the, this is yeah, typical. Yeah. Every time you dialogue with a Mormon, they the, and this is this is very very typical. So, um, if I said, for instance, you know, Mormons don't believe in God as we understand Him, I mean, I'll probably get fifteen Mormons that'll call the show and say, <laughs> "Oh, we absolutely do." All right, yeah. because they use the same vocabulary. They use the the words God and Jesus and Scripture and Bible, and they'll comb through the Christian tradition and they'll look for vocabulary words that they then want to invest with their own idiosyncratic meaning, mm. all right? But this is just the, the, this is the logical fallacy of equivocation, all right? It's you, 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 you grab a word, and then you try to invest that word with a meaning that it doesn't actually have in its original context. Yeah. When the Christian fathers talk about theosis, I mean, absolutely, we Catholics believe in the doctrine of theosis, that God became man so that men might become God. All right, that we share in his likeness in a created manner. All right, that or share in his nature in a created manner. That's a Catholic dogma. It's just that we mean something marvelously different by those words. But we're not. We don't need to dispute about words. We need to dispute about the substance. Exactly. Now, when I take up the dialogue with Mormons, all right, I don't want to start. I don't want to start with the sort of ancillary issues of eschatology. I want to go right to the core issue of how do you know. That's what I want to go to. How do you know? Because at the, at the heart of the Mormon claim is that the church founded by Christ fell into, into absolute ruin uh, at the death of the last apostle, only to be resurrected by Joseph Smith in the 19th century in a way that is utterly impossible to verify and that all historical and scientific evidence contradicts. All right. And why should I believe his testimony? All right, when it when it is so easily refuted from so many sources, um, and uh, and what kind of a guy does that make Christ, who promised that the gates of hell would not prevail against his church? Mm-hmm. Right. So the and then and of course when you throw the evidence up, 
the ultimate retort of the Mormon is, well, here, read the Book of Mormon, and perhaps you too can experience the burning of the bosom. It's, it's Ultimately, it's an appeal to an interior religious experience rather than to objective evidence. And then it's perfectly reasonable to call that religious epistemology into question. Why should I believe your indigestion? Okay. Preston, thank you so much for your call. That opens up a line for you now, 1-800-585-9396, one 585 9396. This is called a communion here on EWTN. Kate is watching us right now on YouTube. Hey there, Kate. Uh, she says, Dr. Anders, do you think St. Paul had to atone, that is, spend some time in purgatory, for his sins against the disciples and St. Stephen before he later converted and died? Oh, no, certainly not. St. Paul went immediately to heaven. He died the death of a martyr. And, I mean, he, we know from his own testimony uh, you know, he, he made reparation for those sins time and time again in his life. I mean, read the litany of his sufferings that he gives us in Second Corinthians, for instance, or the book of Philippians, having counted all things as loss in comparison to the greatness of knowing Christ Jesus his Lord. Paul lived a very difficult life, and of course he wasn't even fully accepted by the church throughout his entire life. Yeah. He had to battle and contend for yep. his ap- apostolicity for his apostolic office up until, the, up until the end. And of course he died the death of martyrdom. So no, St. Paul... Uh, very adequately canonized by the Catholic Church. Very good. This is called a communion here on EWTN. Our phone number, 1-800-585-9396. 1-800-585-9396. Uh, here's a caller that could not uh, stay on hold for us, Michael in Denver, but he says, I just heard Eve was not actually the first woman, but there was another. Is that true? Okay, thank you. Not as represented in Scripture, no. All right, now, in... in uh, in, in Jewish Mishnah, there mm-hmm. are legend. This is, of course, no part of Scripture and no part of the Catholic tradition. Okay. In Jewish Mishnah, there was a legend about a woman named Lilith, and the the novelist George MacDonald, the Christian writer George MacDonald, once wrote a novel by that title, Lilith. And interestingly enough, um, if you read uh, the novel by C.S. Lewis called *The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe*, mm-hmm. um, there is a reference to Lilith and the white. The uh, excuse me. Um, uh, uh, the White Witch, who holds all of Narnia in spell, you know, to her e- evil power, is identified as having come from the stock of uh, Lilith. All right, wow. and she's related to her. But these are just these are just legends from from Jewish folklore. They have no basis in Scripture, and they're not part of the Catholic tradition at all. Very good. Call to communion in progress here on EWTN. Let's go to Pablo in Atlanta, listening to us on the EWTN app. Hey there, Pablo. What's on your mind today? Um, thanks so much. Um, um, I was discussing uh, with my Jehovah's Witness friend uh, about the uh, primacy of Peter, mm-hmm. and his argument uh, is based on, I, I believe, is Acts chapter 10, verse 5. Uh, it might be, might be, I think that's the verse. And he's saying that uh, uh, Simon's name was not changed to Peter uh, by Jesus. It was only, he only gave him a nickname. But he actually uh, preserved the name Simon. So uh, I don't. I don't. I just wanted to know what to answer. Okay. What, what thanks. All right. That. So um, uh, first of all, it, it is it's it's absolutely true that Simon Peter continued to be called Simon by people who knew him by that name, and it's also true that he continued to be called Peter as well. And, uh, and, of course, the, um, the Aramaic for Peter is Kepha, or Cephas, is sometimes translated in Greek. Mm-hmm. So you can, you can search out the biblical references to Cephas as well. It's the same thing. It's just Kepha. It's Peter under a different title, under uh-huh. a different name, under the Aramaic. Uh, and he was called both. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's just, it, 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 it's, it's a non sequitur. I mean, the argument mm-hmm. that, well, he continued to be called Simon. Well, uh, that's, that's of just, like, no significance whatsoever at all. So it's not a nickname. Well, it it wasn't. I mean, sure, it's a nickname, but so what? I mean, what what's? I mean, he, thou art rock, right? And on this rock, I'll build my church. Hey, Simon, what did you just say? Oh, he he said I'm the rock. Wow, Simon, that's pretty well. You're a rock. Hey, we should call this guy Peter. What? Who? Simon? Yeah. I mean, who cares? He identified Simon as the rock foundation exactly. of the church's unity. That's the point. Who continued to exercise that power and jurisdiction throughout the universal church, such that when he died in Rome, there was universal acclaim. You won't find any other position in Christian antiquity than Rome has the primacy because it inherited the primacy from St. Peter. 
mean, that's the universal position of the Christian faithful, even among those that reject his juridical primacy. There it is. Hey, Pablo, thank you so much for your call. We appreciate that. This is called a communion here on EWTN. We'll have a line open for you at the moment, 1-800-585-9396, 1-800-585-9396. John just sent us a text. He says, I often hear you refer to a notion that Protestants teach that a saved person can be objectively at enmity with God in our will. Can I ask where you get that notion? We teach, as Scripture clearly does, that the saved person is a new creature. Okay, thanks. I appreciate it. So I'm getting this from the, the Protestant dogma of, uh, uh, of uh, total depravity, all right, and the doctrine of justification by faith alone, all right, and, and uh, the, the consistent teaching of the Protestant tradition, Lutheran and Calvinist, down for 500 years, that, n- that uh, even those that have grace continue to objectively offend God and to deserve eternal damnation, such that Luther taught, I mean, and you'll read this in the Augsburg Confession, that the declaration of justification is by the imputed righteousness of Christ alone and not through infused righteousness. And so Luther would use metaphors like a dunghill covered with snow, that mm. objectively the, Christ, the believing Christian with grace remains in a state of enmity with God, deserving eternal damnation, and that he's reputed and imputed righteous for Christ's sake through faith alone, not by the merit of his life because intrinsically he can do nothing, even with the help of grace, to, in, to inherit eternal salvation. Thus, Luther could say things to Philip Melanchthon, his friend, like, go out and commit murder or adultery 10,000 times in a day, and it will not affect your justification before God. Now, let me put the question to you so you can illustrate this. Do you believe, uh, my friend, do you believe that a person, a Protestant, who has true faith in Christ, if they were, say, for example, to go out and commit adultery or to commit a murder, would thereby forfeit their salvation and go to hell if they died. If they had a genuine conversion experience, placed their faith in Jesus, professed faith in him, really believed that he died for their sins and that they were forgiven through faith alone for his sake, could that person lose that state of salvation through grave sin? If the answer to that question is yes, then you have a Catholic view of justification. If the answer to that question is no, then... You've just admitted my point that, I mean, a person cannot commit a grave moral fault with intention, like murder, adultery, apostasy, or so forth, and be in union with God in the interiority of their will. If I desire what's contrary to God's will and I act upon that, you know, by actively killing someone or committing adultery, then I am objectively at enmity with him in my will. I'm not reconciled to God in my will. I may have professed faith in him. I may genuinely believe that I'm reconciled to him through the imputed righteousness of Christ, but I'm not willing what he wills because he wills a a life of moral perfection for me. And if I'm not willing that for myself, then we're at enmity in our wills. Now, if you think that disqualifies you from the grace of God, then that's the Catholic view of justification. But if you think that that you can actually persevere in that state of objectively willing evil and be saved, then that's my point. Okay. Uh, John, thank you so much for your text. We do appreciate that, and we hope that uh, kind of clarifies things for you. When we come back from our quick break here, we'll get to a call from Kirk in Ludington, uh, Michigan, who has a, a very good uh, explanation or a very clear explanation of why he doesn't want to become Catholic. So you want to stick around for that. We'll also be uh, getting a question here from Rod, who's watching us right now on YouTube, wanting to know about general versus particular judgments. So uh, David will explain that for you. We'll also get to one from Nathan watching us on YouTube talking about the beatific vision. Lots coming up right here on this edition of Call to Communion. Our phone number 1-800-585-9396. 1-800-585-9396. You can also text the letters EWTN to 55000. Do stay with us for lots more Call to Communion. What's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Andrews. 1-800-585-9396. Glad you could join us for this edition of Call to Communion here on EWTN. Our phone number 1-800-585-9396. Let's get right back to it and talk with Kirk in Ludington, Michigan. Hey there, Kirk. What's on your mind today? Uh, Kirk in Michigan, are you there? I, I didn't hear you. Go right uh, ahead. The phone went blank. <laughs> oh, no. 
never mind uh, things about discussions with people, Christians that are really, I would call, very indoctrinated Christians, but why they left the Catholic Church. And um, I had discussed certain things. I've studied a lot about it. Um, I, I know a lot of people have left the church because they couldn't possibly believe or understand why a priest would fall from grace and get involved with, we won't have to go into it, I'm sure your listeners know, but into a serious sin nature. And I have come up with the answer to that. The people don't realize they go into uh, uh, police stations and into jail. They don't know why they, they did what they did. Well, the simple reason to that is a lot of people don't believe in Satan. Well, Satan, I believe, is really an existent spirit and is in high gear right now with what we see going on in the world. And that's why I believe we should put on the whole armor of God every day. A lot of people may not even know that prayer. But Are, another uh, thing, too, Kirk, is Kirk, do you have just, a, Kirk, uh, do you have a question? Do I have a question? Oh, sure, I have many questions. The, uh, the, uh, is there something you'd like uh, me to respond to? On, on a lot of things. Is there something you'd like um, me to respond to, Kirk? Well, anything, just basically... Um, so what, I got, what I've gotten them. so far out of, your, out of your call is that you, people leave the Catholic Church because some priests have done scandalous things, and yeah. you ascribe that that's, scandalous that's very, behavior yeah, to, the agency, to the agency and, of Satan. Ex- okay, well, I, pre- I can respond yeah. to that. I can respond to that. All right. And you said, basically, why would people do such scandalous things? And your answer was, Satan is alive and at work in the world. All right. So I'm... I suspect you're probably correct. I mean, in fact, I'm, I'm I'm pretty sure you're correct that there have been people who have left the Catholic Church because of the scandalous behavior of priests. Um, and and uh, what do I, and do I think that Satan is at work in that? Yeah, to be sure, absolutely. Yeah, sure. I would uh, no doubt about that whatsoever at all. Um, so how do I handle that as a Catholic? Well, I became Catholic. I'm a convert to the Catholic Church. I became Catholic in 2003. And if you remember something about the, the clergy sex abuse scandal that broke in the United States, you'll know that 2002 was kind of the apogee, the sort of the heyday of media coverage on that issue, in which the church had probably never appeared in a worse uh, PR position in American history. And, and when I became Catholic, the knowledge that there were abusive Catholic clergy did not deter me from becoming Catholic for even half a second. All right? not, I didn't even give it a second thought. Um, am I naive? No, not at all. I mean, I've got my eyes wide open on this. And in fact, uh, what won me to the Catholic faith was the study of tr- Christian history. And if you study Christian history for five minutes, uh, you're, the, the corruption of the Catholic hierarchy is thrown into your face in large measure, writ, writ large across history over and over and over yeah. again. All right. yeah. So why on God's green earth would I want to join such a human, corrupt, abusive organization as this arcane, superstitious thing called the Catholic Church. At least that's how I viewed it, you know, growing up as mm-hmm. a Protestant. Well, and the reason why is for, because I believe that Christ founded the church because he said so. Jesus said to St. Peter, you're the rock, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And he gave all kinds of assurances and promises. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. What you loose on earth is loose in heaven. Whoever hears you hears me. Whoever rejects you rejects me. As the Father sends me, so I send you. Whoever sends you, forgive or forgiven. Whoever sends you, retain or retained. And uh, that's some pretty powerful language coming down from Jesus. And what I found was that historically, there's only one Christian community in existence with a, with a direct historical continuity to that church founded by Jesus, and that's the Catholic Church. And uh, Christ himself picked the the first 12 bishops, if you will. He picked the 12 apostles. And, uh, you know, based on any sort of sociological analysis or psychological profiling, he did a pretty lousy job, right? Because one of them uh, positively betrayed him and then went out and hung himself. Yep. The rest of them were cowards, uh, none more so than the guy he put the head of the whole organization. St. Peter denied him three times. And then you would think Peter would get his act together after the resurrection, but we know from St. Paul's testimony in Galatians that Peter continued sticking his foot in his mouth and kicking himself you know, from behind yeah. uh, in, until his death in martyrdom. So Christ himself didn't know how to pick a well-functioning, smooth-oiled machine of a bureaucratic organization. He picked a bunch of fishermen and income poops who went around kicking themselves in the feet and making fools of themselves until they died as fools for Christ. All right, that's the church that Christ founded. Now, why? Why would Jesus set it up this way? All right, to take such a bunch of bumbling nincompoops and give the message of salvation and the governance of his universal society called the church to such as these. All right, well, St. Paul says that we've been put on display like fools for Christ in front of the whole world so that the surpassing power of God might be made known, that we know this thing comes from him and not from human wisdom. 
And the fact of the matter is the church exists for one purpose, and that's the salvation of souls, to bring people to holiness and to heaven. And it does that manifestly in every age. She is replete with sanctity and saints. So for every corrupt Catholic prelate and hierarch who's fallen into corruption, uh, you know, we've got, we've got saints of outstanding purity like Mother Teresa or Catherine of Siena or Francis of Assisi or St. Dominic uh, bringing thousands and thousands of thousands of souls to holiness and health and healing and salvation. And when I became a Catholic, I didn't join the Church of Cardinal Law in Boston. I, enjoyed, I joined the Church of St. Francis of Assisi and Augustine of Hippo and Thomas Aquinas and Catherine of Siena and Therese of Lisieux and of Jesus Christ, you founded the organization. And when I go to Mass and I celebrate the Mass, the priest celebrates it, and I'm there participating and offering my prayers and sufferings, I'm offering them together with the universal Church that's replete in saints and holiness. And that's something a man can believe in. You bet. Uh, Kirk, thank you so much. You do call us back sometime. This is called a Communion here on EWTN, our phone number one 800 585 Nine three nine six and uh, David. Yesterday at the end of the show, I think we were down to the last two minutes. And Daniel from Fenton, Missouri, called in. You'll remember, and he had a, a couple of questions, and they were a little bit on the complex side. And you said, "If I didn't answer your questions, uh, call us back." So we've got Daniel back on the line today. Oh yeah. Uh, so uh, Daniel, we're going to go to you next. And uh, what else did you want to know about? Daniel, are you there? I'm I'm here. Thank you, gentlemen, for taking my call again today. Sure. What, what what's up? Well, so I alluded to it briefly yesterday, and just try to try to try to bring that second part of the question in, and it's concerning salvation. And I'll just preface this briefly and and tell you guys where I'm at. I've I've been to school in the Reformed Protestant tradition. That's been my upbringing for the I don't know the last ten years. But I'm trying to analyze the Catholic faith. It, as you touched on, Dr. Andrews, a moment ago, it does have a claim to historical continuity, and I'm a avid proponent of history, and it, it interests me greatly. Anyway, I'm trying to analyze this, this matter in, of salvation and the difference between Protestant teaching and, and Catholicism. Wasn't it Luther who, uh, before he broke with the Catholic Church, spent so much time in confession because he had such an, a developed conscience to where every sin he, he committed, he would go and he would confess to the priest. And he, he, I think the way I've been told, he just had no assurance of salvation and because he had to keep confessing and keep confessing. And I, I resonate with that. So getting to my question, could you speak to the, the teaching of the Catholic Church concerning, or if there is an assurance of salvation, looking to the distinction between venial sins and mortal sins. And if you could touch on that, that's basically my sentence, or my question in a few sentences. Sure, absolutely, Daniel. I really appreciate it. So I want to point something out about your question that perhaps you haven't thought about, but I resonate with deeply myself, because like you, I was raised within the Reformed tradition. Have you ever considered the extent to which Luther's neurotic condition, and and his what you've described can be characterized as nothing other than a neurotic condition, all right? How Luther's neuroticism becomes an archetypal event for shaping the Protestant moral imagination. And like you, I was, uh, this is a story that I heard recounted over and over again in childhood and college and school and seminary, and it stands as a kind of beacon or an icon of the world outside of Reformed Protestantism, and it's supposed to characterize what life is like aside from the Reformed faith or the Lutheran faith, that man is tossed back on his endless self-examination and can have no assurance or peace of conscience whatsoever at all, and Luther's absolutely tormented conscience is meant to be sort of an illustration of what awaits the man who doesn't embrace the doctrine of free justification. All right. Now, is that is that how you've heard Luther presented in the tradition? I mean, it really is an apology yes. for the Reformed doctrine of assurance. Now, I don't know how many Catholics that you know personally. Maybe you don't know any, uh, or um, how many of you you've studied historically, whether you've read the life of St. Augustine or St. Thomas or St. Dominic or Catherine of Siena or Therese of Lisieux, whoever it might be. But I wonder... If, if your experience of Catholics in history or in personal relationship is that they're particularly given to neuroticism more so than your average Presbyterian. Mm. I mean, it, 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 do you find that, that Catholics as a, as, a, as a rule are particularly given to scrupulosity or neuroticism more than your average, say, Presbyterian? 
in fairness, I don't know many Catholics, less than a handful, but I'd, I'd wager to say probably not. Yeah, I would wager to say probably not, too. And in fact, it's interesting when you actually study out the social history of the Reformation, as I did, I mean, this was my historical, I mean, my, my professional background, when you look at, say, John Calvin in Geneva in the 1540s, what he contended with in trying to, if, if I might coin a term, Calvinize the city of Geneva, you would expect that if this characterization of Catholic life were accurate— that Calvin would have spent all of his time running around sort of trying to pacify all these tender consciences and people that were biting their fingernails off worrying if they were going to heaven. And if you actually read the social history of Geneva, you know he had the opposite problem. He viewed his own, his own parishioners as libertines uh, given to moral license, and he was always trying to kind of beat them into line morally and get them on board with his, with his uh, particular reformation. And in, uh, I think it was 15... Uh, 55, when he finally got the right to excommunicate, he excommunicated 15% of his city. Wow. All right. I mean, that, he, he had, it, it, he, it, neuroticism and scrupulosity were not the problem he was dealing with. It was quite the contrary. Sure. Okay. And, uh, and if you've read the records of the Genevan consistory, that was the ecclesiastical court where Calvin was calling people in and investigating them and questioning them about their faith. You, you might find one or two people that had scrupulosity about their salvation. Far more, it was the opposite. It was people going, why does Calvin get to tell me what to do? And what do you mean I can't leave my wife and, you know, go off with my secretary? Mm -hmm. I mean, it was the opposite problem. And, uh, and what you find, actually, is that it, Calvin himself, when he talks about his own biography, particularly in the Psalms commentary, you don't find a man with torment tormented conscience, nor did Zwingli represent himself that way. But Luther's tower experience, if you will, becomes kind of a propaganda trope that gets noised about in the Reformation and, and, uh, and an explanation for why people ought to become Reformed or Lutheran. But I, 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 I characterize it like this. If you wanted to know what Republicans believe, would you ask Nancy Pelosi? <laughs> you know, if you want to know what the Democratic Party is all about, are you going to ask, uh, you know, Newt Gingrich? No, you know you're going to get a very ideological and colored propagandistic answer. Mm -hmm. all right? And so if you want to know what Catholic interior life was like in the 16th century, don't go to the number one propaganda trope articulated by the opponents of the Catholic Church, who took one man's particular neurotic condition and made that a kind of archetype to interpret mm -hmm. the entire movement. Mm -hmm. all right? that's, that's not the way you do history. It's not rational. It's not sound. Yeah. And what we find is that Luther's, Luther's particular uh, neuro neuroticism did not go away when he became Protestant. But he continued to suffer deep scrupulosity and anxiety throughout his life, and it got trans. Uh, transformed into different idioms, into different milieu. But if you've ever read Mark Edwards' book, Luther's Last Battles, for instance, you know that Luther tended to see the world in very black and white terms, and everybody was either God or Satan. You were for him or you were against him. And he died uh, in, a, in, a, in a great deal of anxiety, still wondering if God had accepted him if, as he was saved. So the thing didn't go away for Luther, and he mm -hmm. wrote about it. He theologized about his trials and temptations that he called his unfectin. All right? That was something that was peculiar to his own psychology, and it, today we would characterize it as obsessive-compulsive disorder, scrupulosity type. And probably Luther suffered from bipolar uh, condition type 1 because he had these tremendous highs and these tremendous lows. And if you've ever met anybody that's bipolar or that's incredibly scrupulous you know, with obsessive-compulsive disorder, you know you cannot reason or theologize them out of it. There, there are cognitive behavioral therapies that work. Unfortunately, they hadn't been discovered in the 16th century. Yeah. But now let me get around to your real core it, theological question, which is what kind of assurance can Catholics have of salvation? The best kind. The best kind of all. All right. In the Reformed tradition, in the Lutheran tradition, a man, the Westminster Confession of Faith teaches that a man can have infallible certainty of his salvation. That's what the Westminster Confession teaches. Infallible certainty. How, I ask you? Well, once he's made the determination that he has true and saving faith, that just kicks the problem up a level. Mm -hmm. How do you know if you're a Calvinist? How do you know that you have true and saving faith? Because the same confession also says that a man can have a false faith, a spurious faith, and be deceived about his assurance of salvation. The entire dynamic of Puritanism was invented to address the problem of salvation and assurance, and a treatise like Edward's Religious Affections was a way of trying to answer that question. And the history of Puritanism is such that they never answered the question to their own satisfaction. So hence the antinomian controversy with Anne Hutchinson in Boston. All right. And it was, it was an unending torment to the Puritan conscience. All right. If you ever read Perry Miller's The New England Mind, for instance, you get a really good description of that. Or Janice McKnight's book, uh, Orthodoxies in Massachusetts. 
T Perry Miller, who was the great historian of Puritanism, said that Protestants may have saved man from the uh, treadmill of indulgences and penances, but he cast him onto the iron couch of introspection. Yeah. And the Puritan had to turn inward more than anybody else to try to discern within himself the marks of election. A friend of mine put it this way. He said, the Calvinist elect know for sure that they're going to heaven, and I might be one of them. <laughs> All right. So that's not the kind of assurance that Catholics want. We don't want an assurance based on interiority, right. on the ability to ascertain whether I have true faith or false faith or the quality of my contrition or whatever it is. All right. Our assurance of salvation is grounded in the objective word of promise from Christ, who said to the apostles, whoever sins you forgive are forgiven. Period. End of paragraph. I experienced this liberation from neuroticism, from Lutheran psychosis, pardon me for being so blunt, but that's how I experienced it, when I became Catholic and I went into the confessional and I made a confession of my sin, and the priest said to me, God the Father of mercies has sent the Holy Spirit among us for the forgiveness of sins. May God grant you pardon and peace and I, through the ministry of the church. May he grant you pardon and peace, and I absolve you of your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I heard those words wash over me like so much liberation mm -hmm. from 30-plus years of Puritan neuroticism, always questioning whether my faith had been genuine or true or whether it was false, whether my assurance was real or spurious. And in a moment, in a flash, I saw the psychological liberation granted me by this tremendous tradition founded by Jesus and the promise attached to the sacrament, not based on my interior life, but on his authority, that whose sins were forgiven were forgiven, and I was objectively forgiven. If you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will have life, you abide in me, and if I abide in you and your words, if my words abide in you and you abide in me, you will have life. Without me, you can do nothing. I know where his body and blood are found. I know where the grace of the sacraments is to be found. If I remain in communion with him and the sacraments, I have the objective promise of my salvation. If I depart, that's on me. Yeah. But I know where to go for grace. Daniel, what a great call. Thank you so much. We hope that's helpful for you in your own faith walk. This is called a communion here on EWTN. Let's go now to Steve. Uh, no, no, I beg your pardon. Let's go to J.D. in Dallas. He's been listening on, uh, on hold there for quite a long time. J.D.'s listening to us on Guadalupe Radio today. J.D., what's on your mind today? Well, hello, gentlemen. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. Dr. Anders, I have the utmost respect for you as a scholar and a teacher in that response to the last caller was epic. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to go back and listen to that That's again. Pretty Thank awesome. you, Jenny. I appreciate that. <laughs> my my um, question has to do with, uh, I need some help in understanding God's omniscience uh, and how we reconcile that with our own free will. It seems to me that if he, he has, uh, if he's all-knowing, he sort of knows how things are going to turn out, uh, what would be the point of free will? How does that work? Okay, thanks. Uh, first of all, we have experience in daily life all the time of having nearly perfect foreknowledge of human events that we don't cause. Okay, and I think you've, you may have heard me use the illustration in the past of my, my father when he was a three or four-year-old was at his aunt's house and the wood-burning stove was heated up and his, his mother and his aunt said, Louis, don't go touch the wood-burning stove, you'll get burned. And he gave him this kind of cheeky little look and said, I'll show you. And he pulls his little fingers out and starts walking towards the stove. They knew exactly what he was up to. Mm -hmm. They knew with, I would say, nigh unto infallible certainty that he was going to freely choose to burn the fingertips off of his poor little fingers because he was going to be cheeky and show him he didn't have to listen to him. And they allowed it to happen, though they could have prevented it. For what purpose? Number one, so he'd learn not to touch wood-burning stoves. And number two, so that he'd learn how to listen to his mother and his aunt. They could have prevented it. It was in their power to stop it. They had near-perfect foreknowledge of the outcome, and yet it was his free decision to do it nonetheless. Their foreknowledge did not cause his free human action. Okay, and it's the same way with God. God can have perfect foreknowledge of human decisions, all right, and anticipate the end from the beginning, and it doesn't destroy our free human agency. Now, what's the point of free will, and how does this all work out? Well, he, you know, St. Thomas makes a big deal about the difference between primary and secondary causality. God is the primary cause of everything that happens, but as part of his primary causality, he chooses, he, he intends to allow secondary causes a real form of agency. So in, in the natural world, I mean, uh, you know, gravity really does suck you down to earth. Fire really does burn, all right? You know, birds' wings really do propel them on the air, all right? There really are secondary causes that have a real causal efficacy, even though God underwrites the whole system. And the same thing happens with human willing. Like human willing, really, it, there was a physicist, early 20th century American physicist, who said that if, if something in physics uh, 
ultimately ran contrary to his intuition that he really did move his finger, that he would rewrite all of physical law to accommodate the, the infallible certainty he had of his ability to move his own finger. We know that we have uh, the ability to deliberate and act. All right. I mean, h- there's hardly anything more manifest to us than that I can deliberate and act. And, um, and God has underwritten the system that makes that a real constitutive part of reality and a real secondary cause in order to bring about the outcomes that he foresees and foreordains. Okay. Hey, uh, J.D., we do appreciate your call. Thank you so much for it. This is called to Communion here on EWTN. We go now to Steve in Houston listening to us on the EWTN app. Hey there, Steve, what's on your mind today? Hey, I was hoping you guys, you might be able to help me. Um, I'm Anglican uh, as of right now, but my wife and I both uh, felt as if God was calling us to be Catholic. Mm-hmm. Uh, we became uh, we came in touch with the liturgy and uh, early church fathers when we became Anglican. We'd never even uh, heard of that before. And uh, then I came across uh, Journey Home with Marcus Grodi, and I just started listening and listening, and I watch him every time he's on now. And it just it opened my eyes to a journey I was on. And uh, so our father at, at our Anglican church is a very nice guy. Uh, we love the people there. We decided to go talk to him because he always says, if this isn't the church, you know, let me help you find one. And um, he goes, I told him we were interested in it. He said, let me pray a couple weeks, and then we'll talk about it. So we did. And when he came back, and he said that, just to make all this as brief as I can, he said that he had red flags every time he prayed about our daughter because we had recently taken her, when we turned to Anglican, um, she did the sign of the cross during chapel because she was at a Baptist school. Mm Mm-hmm. And they all told her she was Catholic and that she was going to hell and she lost a lot of friends. So we pulled her out of there and put her in the public school. Uh, and she also lost some of the friends that she does uh, rodeos with. Mm-hmm. And that all was taking place. So when uh, we spoke with our priest, he said that he felt like that it was going to be too much of a change for her to switch churches, and that he also did mention... Um, Steve, we're almost we, we, yeah, we're almost out of time. Could you give us a question, yes, please? Well, that's it. I want to become Catholic, but um, my father, the priest that I spoke to at my church, said he put up those red flags that he's getting from God. Okay, all right, thanks. I, 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 I got two things to say, Stephen. I really appreciate it. First of all, um, your priest has articulated two criteria for making a decision about where to worship God, all right? And the first one was a kind of utilitarian consumerism, Mm -hmm. or or maybe a a consumeristic utilitarianism, okay? Namely, that you you should choose the religious community that causes the least amount of psychic distress to some member of your family, okay? Um... And uh, that was his one criteria. The other criteria is his funny internal feelings, red mm. flags that he gets when praying. Now, let me ask you, Steve, do you believe that Jesus wants you to make your decision about how to worship God based on either utilitarian criteria or your pastor's funny internal feelings? Michael? Well, to be honest with you, I trust him. So it, it's the question's not so simple to me. Um, I feel like maybe he has well, a better connection <laughs> to God than I do. Uh, okay, all right. So so do you think that that Christ has identified the the e- emotional state of your pastor as the criterion by which you should make decisions about the proper worship of God? No, no, but I think that God could speak to him. Well, God spoke through Balaam's ass. I mean, and I mean the donkey, right? Yes, I mean, thank God, you, thank you. But, I mean, God, God speaks through all kinds of people. God spoke through the prophet Jonah unwilling. God yeah. can speak to you through anybody in any way, okay? But my question is, what are, what are the criteria that Christ has articulated for, for forming our life of worship in God and service, all right? And I don't see that the utilitarian criteria of, is this going to cause distress to a member of my family, or... The, the subjective state of a Protestant pastor's soul are in themselves determinative. We have to answer the question, what is the, what is the church that Christ founded? All right, 
And do I have a moral obligation to join it? And if you want to talk about causing psychic distress to your daughter, if you disobey your conscience, that will long-term cause her far more psychic distress. Yes, indeed. It's more important that her father and her mother live with clear consciences before God. Steve, thank you so much for your call. Sorry we kind of ran out of time there. Dr. David Andrews, thank you, my friend. Appreciate that. And we also thank everybody for watching and listening today here to Call to Communion. I'm Tom Price. We'll see you next time. God bless.